Namuna Rayanaya. This is a recording of a talk of James Swartz on the Bhagavad Gita at Yoga Vidya Bad Meinberg near Hanover in Germany. Murti Beda Vibhagini Vyoma Bad Vyapta Dehaya Dakshinamurtaye Namaha Sarva Vedanta Siddhanta Gocharam Tamagocharam Govindam Paramanandam Sadkurum Pranatosmiham Om before, before we get started, I had a couple of questions, and something I think I neglected to uh, point out about karma yoga and samsara. Uh, first question, this gentleman in the back, I don't know your name? Manu. Yeah, you were asking about Krishna and Ishwara and so forth? Yeah, I'm asking about the word Ishvara because here we learn Ishvara is, for example, Krishna as uh, God with properties. And I understand how you use Ishvara, I would say it's Atman. Uh, that's correct, both. It's both. Yeah. Ishvara with properties, I think the way you're taught in yoga is that uh, that will be your Ishta Devata. Do they tell, call that about your Ishta? Means your p personal deity? Hmm? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Oh, so so okay. So Ishwara there is called is 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 Saguna Brahman. Is awareness plus qualities. Hmm. That's Ishwara. That's correct. But. Uh, that Ishwara, that one with qualities, is is it conscious or is it not conscious? Conscious. Conscious. We know that Ishwara is conscious. Why do we why do we know you can't see that Ishwara? You can't smell it, taste it, touch it, or feel it. But you know it's conscious. How do you know it's conscious? By observing the creation. The creation is intelligently designed, isn't it? Isn't everything that everything here completely intelligently designed? Hmm? <laughs> There's not it, it's a it's a amazing creation. You have billions of objects, millions of processes and forces, laws, jivas of all sorts, and all of them are working what? In one harmonious whole all the time. Every single thing here is, is designed and carefully following its nature, isn't it? So whatever create, huh? Our our means of knowledge for Ishwar is inference. So by observing the effect, which is the creation, we can see that it's intelligently designed. Nothing is out of place. Everything has a purpose here. We can infer that Ishwara is conscious. If Ishwara is not conscious, then things won't work here, will they? If, if Ishwara doesn't uh, make fire hot, say, Ishwara is thinking, well, I've got to keep fire going. I've got to keep it hot because the whole creation depends upon the fire. And then one day Ishwara wakes up in the morning and he says, ah, I'm so tired of keeping the fire going, I think I'll make fire cold today because it's easier to make fire cold. So then Ishwara makes fire cold. What's going to happen here to the creation? Disintegrate. 
every single thing here is required to make everything else work. If you take any one of these principles, any one of these laws, forces or factors out of the dream of Maya, the whole thing collapses. Which shows what? That it's intelligently designed and that the creator is not a person. It's huh? It's it's intelligent, and and huh? It's totally intelligent, but it's not a person. It can maintain its concentration on the creation for trillions of years without what? Without having one thing out of place in the whole creation. That's not a person. Jiva can concentrate and maintain its creation for a period of time, but its concentration will go and its creation will disintegrate. So Ish Ishwara is just the force or the intelligence or the power and that Ishwara has all the qualities, what, in, every quality that you see here in the world and in yourself is what? A quality of Ishwar. That's what we mean. It's Saguna. It's with Gunas. Ishwara with Gunas. But this Ishwara <laughs> is the consciousness that this Ishwara needs to, make, huh, to intelligently design and operate and maintain the creation. And the creation remains constant, steady. It always works because behind the creation, Ishwara doesn't change. Ishwara just shines huh? awareness, light on the creation. And since it's infinite and unchanging, the, all, the, all the forces in the creation maintain their infinite also. They're eternal. Now some people now Krishna. When you take Krishna, they're in the in the bhakti state in the in the second in the in the the third state of bhakti. There you, once you've got your karma yoga going, then you can choose a a dev, a, a de, an ishta devata. That is, you can take some form or symbol of Ishwara, like Ganesha or Shiva or Krishna. Or Rama, or Sita, or any one of these forms, and you can meditate on them because they have the qualities of Ishwara. So they're just a way to remind you of the qualities of Ishwara, which are your own qualities, good and bad. So, so we call that Ishwara with qualities, I call Ishwara too, and what? The Ishwara without qualities I call Ishwara one. Because there's a confusion in the literature. In all of the in all the Vedic literature, there's a confusion with the way the word is used. Sometimes the word refu refers to Ishwara one and sometimes it refers to Ishwara two. Hmm. So this needs to be explained. The other the other question was you know what when uh, when we're talking about uh, motivations in sansara we're saying that that samsara is a zero sum, sum game and therefore you shouldn't look for a lasting happiness in the samsara the operative word is lasting now if uh, and this is the point. If you're happy with temporary happiness, then enjoy samsara. We're not saying you shouldn't enjoy samsara, enjoy the world or the objects. We're not saying you shouldn't have relationships, you shouldn't have jobs, you shouldn't do things here at all. We're just saying that if you should do it, 
understanding that what? The pleasure that comes from doing it is not going to last forever. When you eat a nice meal, you, you don't expect that pleasure from that meal to last forever, do you? The pleasure from the meal lasts for, you know, a few minutes, maybe an hour or two. I'm very satisfied with my, with my uh, spaghetti, what was it, macaroni. Mm -hmm. And, and the, that was very tasty. I'm still feeling good from that. <clears throat> still feeling happy <coughs> thinking about that nice meal. And some <laughs> this gentleman gave me some chocolate. And I still can taste the chocolate. It's very nice. <laughs> but like in an hour or, or 20 minutes or what, that pleasure is going to be gone, isn't it? Now, now I, I know, let me, let me check that. <laughs> I, I, know, I know that that, that pleasure is going to be gone. Hmm? And it's fine. So if you know, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, if you uh, if you can if you can accept uh, that the fact that things don't last, like when you when you have sex and you have an orgasm, you don't expect that to last for a day or two, do you? <laughs> huh? Do you, do you expect huh? do you expect that to last a whole week? No, you don't. Because you go back the next day for a little more. <laughs> right? So, you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't contact objects. In fact, you're always in contact with objects. So, there's, it's fine. It's just the expectation that makes the agitation in your mind. Now, like the other thing was about relationships. Yeah, obviously, the the... One of the most important objects for human beings, maybe the most important object is what? Is love, love relationships. You, you get conditioned to love relationships from when you're a child, when you're a baby. Immediate, you pop out of the womb and you have no relationship. Huh? Well, actually, you did have a relationship with your mother before. When you pop out, you don't have any relationships. You're just a little empty body, and suddenly somebody takes them, takes you to them and starts to love you and give a relation and develop a relationship with you. So you have, and that's that's a loving relationship, or not, but generally, at least in the beginning, it's usually a loving relationship. So you have an expectation. You develop a vasana for relationships. Here. Now, if you expect a relationship with an object to last forever, like when you, and that, and you know, when you grow up and you're no longer, and your parents have weaned you, you've separated from your parents and you become an individual on your own, then, then you, you want to have, you know, you, you, that vasana for that relationship is, is deep. And so you want to transfer that Vasana to another person. So you get, huh, you, that's usually when you get married or when you have a relationship with somebody. The, 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 you want, you need, you've, you've had a, a, a loving relationship with an object. That loving relationship has changed when you grow up. Huh? That dependent relationship and it becomes independent and you don't, aren't attached to your parents anymore. You're an individual on your own. Then what? You still have that vasana for relationship, so then you uh, you move that vasana goes on to another person. Usually, it's what relationships relationships about. Now, those th that kind of vasana for relationships is is very very difficult not to uh, in indulge in. Because it's so deep, it starts with childhood. Only, only like one or two percent of the people, maybe even less, uh, of human beings, don't crave that, have that vasana for relationships. Some, you, sometimes you'll see a little, uh, even when a child is very young, 
He doesn't really care. He just enjoys themselves. They play by themselves. If the mother loves them, it's fine. If the mother doesn't love them, they're enjoying themselves, and they just go on. It's, some parents don't like that because they want the child to love them more and be more clingy. And some parents say, thank God I got that kind of child. I don't have to look after it all the time. So, uh, But those are like sannyasi people, and they don't have that deep uh, craving for relationships. But the point is that there's nothing wrong with a relationship if you're going for moksha. Now, that's not... Let's put it this way. Well, there's nothing right with a relationship if you're going for moksha, and there's nothing wrong with a relationship if you're going for moksha. It's just a matter of understanding uh, why you want a relationship, what you expect from a relationship, and how to conduct a relationship if you have one. Which means what? How, how do I conduct a relationship? if I have one, to make it successful. I do it as karma yoga. Hmm. What, what, if karma yoga is a perfect what attitude to take in a relationship, isn't it? Because there are always these expectations of results. Huh? You expect the other person to be there for you when you need them, don't you? First of all, you don't go into a relationship to be free. <laughs> Do you? That's why that's why we're that's why we that's why we don't at, we don't promote relationships if you want moksha. We don't promote them. Why not? Because you don't go into a relationship to be free. You go into a relationship to be free of loneliness, yes. But what do you get when you get a relationship? You get attachment. In fact, you need to be attached to the object to make the relationship work. Because if you're in an if you're in a relationship and you're not attached, then the huh? Then you won't attain intimacy with and love with that person. Will you? So how do I how do I relate in a relationship? Let's let's assume that that my vasna for love is is so strong that I can't offer it to Ishwara. I can't just say, I'm going to take this love for a person and and convert it into love for you, Ishwara. That's called sublimation. Ishwara is is for a sannyasi. Ishwara is meant to become your lover. But Ishwara is not that good in bed. <laughs> you because know, there's, there's obviously a physical component to this, a karmic component. Action is involved. You know? So I don't go for, for moksha when I'm going for a relationship, but if, if I find myself in a relationship, in other words, if that need for love is strong and it, and it attracts an object, and I find myself in a relationship, then how am I going to manage that relationship successfully? How am I going to make that, that relationship become a vehicle for my spiritual growth? We're not saying it can't be. We're just saying, huh? If you're going directly for moksha, then you won't go for a relationship because, huh? Because relationship is going to, going to generate attachment. So now that I've got my relationship and attachment, how do I deal with the attachment? Well, I do the relationship as karma yoga. Karma yoga will what? Will make it possible, and karma yoga means what? I don't rely upon the object for my happiness. So I don't expect you to make me happy. I expect me to make me happy, and hopefully you've got a relationship with somebody who understands this. They don't expect you to make them happy. They, when they have a need, 
they try to fulfill it from within. They try, huh? And then what? The thing that destroys relationships is what? The continual pressure to what? Supply another person with emotion, with emotional satisfaction. In other words, to, to behave and feel like they want you to behave and feel. When, when maybe it's not possible for you to behave and feel the way they want you to behave and feel when they want you to behave and feel a certain way. It very rarely is, actually, isn't it? So if I, if I, huh? Yeah, think about it. <laughs> you can see why there's a problem. Because you're all, in a relationship, you're always looking for an object to satisfy your desires. That means that's that other person. They have to be, you need, I, I want you to be there for me all the time. And you want me to be there for you all the time. Well, if I'm there for you all the time, I'm really not there for me, am I? Unless I see you as me, which I won't if I'm in a relationship. If I see you as me, then I don't need you uh, to be in. A, I don't need to be in a relationship with you because if I see you as me, then I see me as me, and then everything's fine. Well. <laughs> so, how you know karma yoga is how you manage your anxiety because a relationship as soon as you fall in love, that's wonderful. That's a big high. But what comes right along with it? Anxiety, doesn't it? Immediately there's an anxiety. Immediately there's a worry. Because that object, what? May not be there for you when you need them. You know if their mind changes or their feelings change or they do something, they do some action that makes you angry, then what? Boom, the relationship is toast, finished. So, um, the only way I'm going to be successful in a relationship is if I uh, take the karma yoga attitude. There's going to be, huh? There's going to be a, a, a lot of disappointment in, in relationships. Well, what? How am I meant to take that as prasad? That, huh? That is Bhagawan. That's the Lord telling me how to what? How to handle disappointment. Dis, um, I need to see disappointment as a gift, not as a source of anger. That's what karma yoga means. I have to see the lesson that in disappointment is a gift and take it in that way. If I take it in that way, then what? It's fine. And that means what? I relax in the relationship because I'm ready to take unwanted results in a positive way. And because I relax, then what happens? My partner relaxes. Understand? I diffuse that tension in the relationship because there's always a tension in the relationship. If I'm relaxed, then what? It's almost impossible for that other person to not become relaxed because you're in the same energy bubble. If they're, if they're practicing karma yoga on their side, then you've got a great relationship. And then what? Then you process all of your what? You process all of your attachments and desires and you come to love and respect the person irrespective of whether they satisfy your needs or not. And that's true love. That's real love. Is loving somebody whether or not they give you what you want. If, if, if your love depends upon them giving you what you want, what kind of love is that? Conditional love. It's not real love. It's not true love. Right? So karma yoga can be a vehicle for Right, gaining true love and true bhakti in a relationship. So, uh, I'm, you know, that point is, you know, we're not saying you can't get moksha if you're married and if you are, if you have a relationship at all. 
We're not saying that at all. We're saying if you want the fast track and you have enough, uh, and you have the temperament of a sannyasi, then what? You you don't you can forego a relationship and you'll go very quickly to yourself. And when your relationship with yourself is is complete, then what? Then you can engage in any relationship without attachment or desire. Understand? <laughs> I, I when I got married, you know, it created quite a, fir- a, a, a fuss with some people, well, all women basically, <laughs> because because I they didn't hear what I was saying. They they heard I I said, you know, if you want moksha, you don't go for relationships. Huh? Because the result of going for a relationship is different from the result of going for moksha. <laughs> you don't go to a relationship to get free. You go to a relationship to get attached. You go for intimacy with another person. That's what you want. So I was saying that. Right? And so when, when my wife and I fell in love, they thought I was a hypocrite. They thought I was, huh? I wasn't practicing what I preach, but, huh, I wasn't looking for moksha because I was already free, and neither was she. So it was a completely different situation. Understand? I went into the relationship being happy. I wasn't looking for any relationship, and she wasn't looking for any relationship either. So, huh, so then we appreciated each other's qualities, and then, huh, a non-dual relationship developed, where there's the, the uh, expectation that the person behave in a certain way is not there, and where my needs, I handle my needs with reference to my sadhana, with using discrimination. She handles her needs with reference to that, and we share uh, uh, the love between each other. Yes, excuse me. No, I won't. No, I, no, no, I won't be disappointed because I don't expect it. <laughs> if it's you're only you only love when you, when you love. In other words, when you're paying attention and respect and and to that other person, that's when you're in a relationship. If you're not, you're not. So, huh? So all you do is look and see: Is she paying attention to me? Does she love me? If she doesn't, she doesn't. What can I do? That, I, that's not under my control, is it? I I can't I can't expect her to love me because she's loving me from within. Whatever is making her love me is not under my control. It's prob- It may not even be under her control, or, or it is under her control if she's doing karma yoga or using discrimination, then it's under her control. Then she won't, she won't allow obstacles to her love to break the flow of energy or attention between us. Hmm? Did that answer the question? Yeah. So I don't know how I can choose. I don't even know what I'm doing to Well that's right. See that's the problem with relationships is that all these circumstances in relationships bring up unconscious things that you're not aware of. Well, how do you deal with those? That's the point. Mm-hmm. Right? Do you do you let those things get in, uh, pollute the relationship or do you you have a way to like 
communicate those things in a nonviolent and loving way with that person if if in fact the resolution of those problems depends upon the opinion of the other person of the attitude of the other person because when you're in a relationship you actually depend on the other person Yeah. Of your masters. I'm going to be here and stay and be a witness of the subconscious thing that may come up on you. Yes. And I'm still there. That's maybe karma yoga in a way. That is, yes. Not going. So it's also a trauma to me. I'm going to stand still when all of your things come out and still be there. I don't know. Yeah. Well, (laughs) then, yeah. Then, then you'll you may you may have a very good relationship or you may have a very bad relationship because what if that doesn't work yeah. huh <laughs> that's the point because a person has that the karma yoga is means that i'm open to like transforming myself through this practice if a, if you just say well i i accept you warts and all no matter what and you realize you fall in love with a bitch Huh? Then that means, and you're stuck for the rest of your life. This is the way some people are. Then they say, "I made a commitment for life," and they get stuck with somebody who's a bitchy, nasty person, and then they stay with them their whole life long. Well, hey, is that intelligent? <laughs> Where you know, in in these relationships, you need to look and see. Do, what does that person expect? What kind of person are they? Are they a spiritual person? Who really, really is trying to transform themselves through spiritual living, and if they are, then what? Then there's some hope, particularly if you have the karma yoga attitude. Otherwise, just blindly committing to a person who's all messed up psychologically, huh? I don't know how many people have come to me, and and you know, uh, men and women, you know, and said, you know, they're in these dead end relationships. And they feel obligated to stay in them, even though the woman or the man's not enjoying. Neither person is enjoying themselves. They both don't like the relationship, but neither one of them will leave it because they're not committed to growth. You know, they're not committed to change. Neither one of them wants to what give up their let go of their vasanas, their expectations and their desires. This is why one of the the, the most important qualities Krishna talks about all the time is the spirit of renunciation. You need to have a value for renunciation, for letting things go. In, in, in our case, in the case of inquirers, our own subjective stuff, our vasanas. I have to have a value for getting rid of my desires and fears. If that person doesn't have, if you don't have that value and they don't have that value, then you're just going to end up, right, like faced off and angry and, and, or just bored and indifferent. And you'll never fulfill yourself in love or spiritually. So you always have to use your discrimination. I'll always, you know, keep the big picture in mind. This is what Vedanta is about. Just say, well, what ultimately do I want? But why am I here on earth? What am I doing here? Like, I don't know. I know people don't want to think about this. But you know that everything you get here, you're going to lose, don't you? Huh? As my father used to say, you can't take it with you, means to the next life. You, huh? So everything you accumulate here, everything you have here, you're going to lose. That's just a fact. There's no way that you can carry anything, any relationship or any object, any situation. You cannot carry it forward to the next birth. It's going to stay here. So what am I doing here? (laughs) You know, at the end of my life, what am I going to tell myself I accomplished here? 
what was the purpose of my life. You know, on my on my death on his deathbed, my father told me it was a very interesting statement. It was a very sad statement, but it was a very beautiful statement too. He said, "If there's any advice, any anything I have to say before I die, it's this: too soon old, too late smart." <laughs> He died before he got wise. Well, obviously he got wise before he died, but huh? He, he he wasted all of that time. What going for things that didn't last? That didn't what? That weren't serving him. Chasing all these things that he had to let go. Attached to all these things that eventually you're going to have to let go anyway. You're going to have to let go of the most important thing, which is your body. So you know. What's the big picture here? That's the idea. What's the big picture? Why am I here? Why am I doing what I'm doing? I need to always keep that in mind. Not just get lost in what I'm doing. Because if you don't have that, then you're going to get totally lost here, and you're going to be very disappointed and unhappy But when, when Bhagawan takes it away. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. That's just, huh? that's the nature of life. So we're not for or against anything. <laughs> Understand? Well, that's why we don't like to tell you to do this or to do that. A guru is not somebody who gives you advice about what to do. If a guru is giving you advice about what to do, you better look out. A guru is somebody who gives you what? Discrimination gives you some knowledge that allows you to understand why you're doing what you're doing. So you can you can make intelligent choices here. The last thing I want to do is tell you what to do. How do I know what you're supposed to do? I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. How can I tell you what I'm supposed to do? Huh? You see? So, you know, I'm not, what I meant to say was that we're not saying you have to renounce the world. We're just saying that insofar as you're in this world, then you have to consider what kind of attitude you have toward action and its results, which is what basically what karma yoga is all about. And what it is you really love. You know, on the action level, what you're doing, that's important now. The other topic is love. What is it that I actually love? When I love you, what is it that I love? I need to inquire into that and see what it is. And if you want a successful relationship, then you need to see, understand that when you love somebody, it's just the self in that person that you love. It's that bright, shining light that's that shining out from within that body that you love. It's not that body that you love. Yeah, yeah. They need to be very clear about it. Right. So that's what the bhakti yoga is all about. What do I love? Why do I love it? What can I expect from my love? What kind of love is it? We're not saying do this or do that. We're just saying, you know, understand what's going on. Understand yourself. Know yourself. Always being inquiring. And this, the Vedanta is just a method for inquiry. That's all. It's just a way to help you answer these questions for yourself. Where are we? Well, I don't know if we're going to... Ten to eight... Any more questions? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Um, what about uh, qualities that we develop here? Uh, can we take them to the next level? 
Is yeah, is well, that, that that that's what uh, that's what uh, that's what Arjuna tells Krishna. I mean, Krishna tells Arjuna. Yeah. Um, nothing gets lost. Nothing gets lost, but but if you think about it, yeah. what good does it do? The next person's going to get your quali- good qualities. That's <laughs> 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 Ishvara. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Ishwara does it anyway. Ishwara does it anyway, that's right. Okay. <laughs> the, the, huh? Yeah, okay. The, 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 the per- <laughs> <laughs> I shut my mouth. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, a, it's a normal question. Because you, you think that the personality transmigrates, but it doesn't. Only the vasanas move forward, and a new person comes up next time. That's why that new person doesn't remember who you were before. Because this person's a different person from the one that was here before. But the, the karma and the qualities, they go forward. You know, they don't go forward, it's not quite the right language. Uh, they actually, nothing moves, it's just the what? The vasanas generate a new body for you, they generate a new body that allows those vasanas to work out again. That's all. There really isn't any movement. It's just an apparent movement. What is about the stories that people tell, I did this in that life, and they go and um, prove this and found it's true? Two different stories. Yeah, okay. So, what is, so if what, they what? have remembrance about... Sure, but, but 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 that doesn't make them that person. All all that's happening is that certain people's minds there there's a, a little Ishwar is not perfect in in the way the karma works out. Karma is always imperfect. So sometimes there is like a memory that passes from one some part of a memory passes from one uh, you know, one incarnation or one birth to another. But usually that uh, it doesn't have any impact on the on the life here, and usually after a few years it all disappears. And the person says, "So what? I was that then. It doesn't help me now, huh?" Because <laughs> the, the, you know the person that was there had to function in a different environment in different situations. But now this person's got a new situation, a new environment, and so that that person doesn't belong here. There, there's a number of interesting stories about that. I, I one time I had a vision of who I, who I was in my pe- in the in the most recent life in the most in life just before this. But so what? So what? I mean, <laughs> so what? Uh, so you know, so what? I, that person isn't here. That person's are there in my memory. Huh? That's all. And, and I didn't know that much about that person, actually. I just knew in some way that I was that person, that's all. But it didn't mean anything, really. I, st- I got problems right now here that I've got to solve. Who cares what you were yesterday? Mm-hmm. But there are past life therapies, hmm? so they care. And what do those therapies do? Do those therapies set you free and give you moksha? <laughs> no way yeah. it's all silly you know what's the point what do you hope to achieve by going into the past and finding out who you to were clean, to clean the why would that clean you to clean to repair some problems you have to understand no all the problems no no no, no way mm-hmm. every problem that you have Huh? It appears right now in the form of a problem. Just heal the problem that's present now. A, a, a solving a past problem is not solving a past problem. It's solving a present problem. So you don't need to refer to the past because you know what your vastness are right now. You know what it is that's hanging you up. Huh? Because the past is always expressing right now here in the form of whatever problem you have at the moment. So, so thinking that you can go back to another time and sort it out and that's going to solve this problem, you know, what's the point? 
the way you solve the pro- the way you solve this kind of problem is one you investigate the nature of the problem with reference to the teaching hmm? and you take and, and you do your karma yoga that's all so well, I have never ever met anybody that that got anywhere with past life regressions in terms of moksha it's just one of those fascinating things that jivas like to do is they get fascinated with their what they call their history. You know? Some people are, are, are historically crazy. My mother was one of those. She wasn't a past life person, but she was only interested in family history. You know? Like I, I thought, what the heck? She went way back like 200 years and found out all this stuff. But what did it do? It didn't change one thing. It didn't affect her. It didn't affect anybody else. Well, it was just a fascination with the jiva, you know. And now where's my mother now? Where's that jiva? Where's that life now? What good does that do? So, no, I, I, uh, you know, I know that's what they say. All of these things, rebirthing and all that sort of stuff, it's supposed to set you free. But of what? Only a memory, maybe. So... (laughs) There, there's in our in our tradition. There's absolutely no sanction for any kind of of any kind of sadhana like that. Isn't it, isn't it one of the, the things you, you need to be to get pure? And if you have some obstacles in your way, that might not be from your from this life, from an experience in this life, and might help you. Uh, that it might have been from another way that frees you. Well, that's true. But but every. But but the past only appears in the present. There is no past. Nothing ever happened in the past. Why, then, why do you have to get pure? To have pure? This is only... Oh, be, oh, no, it's just because, because you can't discriminate when your mind is agitated by an emotional problem. That's all. Yeah, but this is also something from the past. Well, there is until you resolve it. But, but you resolve it in the present by taking the karma yoga attitude. That's how you purify. You, every, if, you take, if you take an event that happened in the past to be real, what are you saying? What, what are you saying? <laughs> yeah, but All you're doing is reinforcing the idea that samsara is real and that person is real and that the past is real and that the problem is real. Huh? Yeah, by paying attention to it, yeah, you're you're creating that problem. You're reinforcing the belief huh, in that problem. Huh? No, I get it. Understand? Mm. Nothing happened in the past. There's no past. Not, tell me what. Tell me what happened in the past. Huh? No, from anybody. Um, when it, she was, she had some, some some things she couldn't write any books. She she was reading a lot and she couldn't write any books. And she went to someone. Um, and so that into her past. Yeah. And uh, she found out that in her past she she's been burned as a witch uh, because of she had some some things with with books. And from that single moment on, she knew that she started to write books like hell. Now, did that happen? Did that experience happen in the past or in the present? It happened in the present. What? Huh? Then no experience happens in the past. No experience happens in the future. Every experience happens in the present. The f- idea that that there, huh? The, 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 there's an idea that something happened in the past, but that idea that something happened in the past only occurs in the present. She, you only experience everything only in the present now. You never experience anything yesterday, and you never experience anything tomorrow. You, huh? You, your memory makes you think that a previous experience huh, happened before the now, and that a future experience is going to happen, huh? But all those experiences are only happening now, so there's there's no past. So what we're saying is, if you have an issue, huh, 
that issue will appear right now here and, uh, in whatever way. And if you have to imagine that you're going to the past and going through all this sort of thing to do it, well, fair enough. But, but you only can clear up an issue in the present. And all issues only appear in the present because there's only one now. There's, there's only one consciousness and there's only one time. There's not life, huh? Time is not linear, a whole bunch of experiences like this, huh? Time is a cycle with no beginning and no end. That's the chicken and the egg. We had that in the first chapter and in several other chapters. Krishna said, things what? Things are either manifest or they're unmanifest. <laughs> they're, huh? In other words, it's a it's a cycle. The thing is always present, but you can either see it or you can't see it in the present. But there's no linear movement of time. Now, what creates a linear movement of time is interpreting discrete experiences in a sequence. Just every experience only appears in the present. But when you add all those up in your mind, it looks like they happened serially. And time does. When you have an experience, is there any time? When you have one experience, no time. When you have two experiences, is there a second experience? Is there any time? Think about it. No. Why not? Because there's no way to evaluate what the distance is between this one and that one, is there? You need some third point of view to what? To determine what the relationship is between one and two. So you either need a self that's present at both experiences that can what? Evaluate the distance, or you need a third experience which will what? Tell you how far this experience is from that experience. But every experience only appears in the present time, in the present moment. So all your your past is continue. Your your present is your past. <laughs> huh? Yeah, but it's there. This, this single moment is there. Sure, but the que our question is this. Our question is this: Does that does your relationship to that experience that whatever it is does that relate does that your relationship to that quiet your mind and make you clear? Huh? And, or does it disturb you? That's all we care about. Because our, our idea is this. We need a mind that's <coughs> capable of discriminating the self from the objects. And if there's emotional disturbance, you can't do that. So we say, okay, just process whatever is coming up right now using this, these two techniques, karma yoga and discrimination. In that way, you can process every every single experience in the present, and your mind is going to get quiet. The reason people are processing past lives and all this sort of thing is what? What's the reason? Because they want to be free of the agitation, isn't it? Huh? Isn't that right? Don't you want to be free of the of the doubt that huh, that's created by that experience? That's why you investigate it. That's why you want an answer. Oh, my mother, in the last life, my mother beat me with a spoon. And that's why I'm angry now. Okay, fine. Okay, if that removes your agitation, fine. <laughs> right? Huh? Yeah, like in this uh, example. <clears throat> what? From him. This uh, example, is, yeah. it removes their agitation. Yeah. She could write now. She's the yeah, that's it. right. Sure. Sure. But but that only happened in the present by inquiry, isn't it? Didn't it? Huh? So we're just saying, here, here's a method of inquiry that doesn't require all of that convoluted logic and all that romantic notions. We're just saying, look and see. Is it real? Does it last? Is it me? Huh? That's what we're saying. Huh? Is it real? Means what? Is it always there? Yeah, it does huh? Does it last? <laughs> huh? What is it? The experience. If you don't know, if you don't remember the experience. You all you no, that's right, but we're talking about any experience that you're processing. 
any thought or feeling? What's my relationship to that thought or that feeling? That's the, huh? How do I resolve that feeling? Now, she's, she's bothered by this problem, whatever it is. And she wants to get rid of this problem, doesn't she? That means what she's really, she's really not interested in getting in the past, is she? She's interested in what? Getting rid of the agitation that's blocking her. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, now, if you can get rid of it that way, fair enough. <clears throat> but, what, but what does that tend to do? That tends to validate you as a jiva and what? The past and experience is real, doesn't it? Where we're saying what? Experience is not real, it doesn't last, and it's not you, so what? Let it go. And the only reason you're interested in it is because you're interested in yourself, but you already have yourself. So look to yourself when you have a problem. Don't look at the problem. Don't make the problem real. What? Look at yourself and see if what? If when you look at yourself, that problem is real. And when you do look at yourself, you see the problem's not real. So then you let it go. Now, having said that, I'm not saying you shouldn't do these practices. I'm just saying that, because Vedanta, as we said, it's for discriminating, dispassionate people, and, and we listed all those qualifications, about seven or eight qualifications. So only those kind of people can do this particular solution, and other people are going to have to do whatever they have to do go rebirthing and past life regressions and if those work. I honestly never met anybody for whom they actually work on a consistent basis. Because presumably if you can get a technique that will remove one, that technique should remove all of your past. So why can't you just uh, just practice that technique on every thought that comes up and then clear your <coughs> mind, you know, in a, in a short time? Why can't you do that? Huh? Because it's part of the game. What game? Like, with, I think like it's law of um, of things leaving trace, right? Things are leaving trace. Leaving traces. Yeah. 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 Dirt on clothes, getting old. Or you gave the example that when we are little, we get love. So later on, we need love. We get. Yeah, you get the vasana. We, we call it. The, yeah. Mm. So I think part of the. Um, of the world of, of this reality is um, this thing that if we go to um, something that happened to make a change in the now, in the experience, in the mind. Yeah. And this is one way. And Freud went on to it through what we call psychoanalyze. And yeah. mystics go to it through um, life regression. And yeah. I think what you're saying is that. Um, there is something deeper that holds all of these little. It's like this yeah. way is like taking with a pinceta. Yeah, you that's do it one by one. And you yeah, say it's all part of one big bag of you. That's correct. That's what I am it's saying. Possible. But if we enjoy the game, you say we enjoy the food, so we enjoy past life aggression. Well, absolutely. And if you enjoy past life aggression, <laughs> regress, <laughs> regress, <laughs> regress, <laughs> regress <laughs> day and night, all you want. <laughs> 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 yeah, absolutely. Huh? But if you think it's going to solve the freedom problem, I think you got another thing coming. It may be helpful psychologically, I don't know. I don't know. I, in my case, I never worried about the past. I, I, don't, I have almost zero thoughts about the past and always and never did. I always have so much desire huh, that I'm always only thinking of the future. And I'm trying to create situations that will give me what I want. And I've been very successful at that so far. I, I can't see any value for me to pick through the past and try to figure out what happened. It doesn't matter to me. Because I've got this method for what? Just dismissing any, any past ideas that come up but as unreal. So that's not real. It's not here. It's not now. It, it, it's temporary. It's not me. Why should I bother with this? But do you never want to change something? No. Okay. 
<laughs> See, if you're satisfied with yourself, why do you want to change anything? Yeah, huh? I have a something that huh? because I, if you if you reflect in time, then you see habits that you think, oh, that's that's something I could change. Sure, so sure. There is a reflection in the past. Yeah. In the future. Yeah, sure. No, if if a habit's bothering you, you don't like it, and you can change it. Please change it. In fact, in fact, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about values. We're talking about, huh? The, we have, we, well, yeah, if you, if you take yourself to be a jiva, yes, there is. Okay, that's true. Uh, absolutely. And if, if there is, then we're saying, we haven't really got to the chapter on values, it's coming up. Uh, but the chapter on values is you look at, analyze your values to see how it is you're creating this problem in the present. In other words, if you created it in the past, you're going to create it in the present. And that's a call, that the reason it's a problem is because your values are not right. If your values were the correct values, then you wouldn't have this problem. So a, a huge part of our analysis for transforming yourself and fixing your past is what? An analysis of your values. So yes, absolutely. If you're a jiva, then you have a past, or you think you have a past, and you have a future, and therefore you should what? Uh, that you have to take care of it. So, yeah. See, I don't think of myself as a jiva. So, so whatever, whatever thoughts come up, I don't, I don't take them seriously. And I found that not taking that stuff seriously just removes it. <laughs> We we have a, the, there's a there's a principle, what what you resist persists. So the more you think about something and make it real, the more you focus on the past, the more what you generate, huh, a, a relationship to something that's not real. Whereas if you just dismiss it and ignore it and say, well, case or all, so what, huh? It goes away because you're not paying attention to it. But I found that people who are who dwell in the past just dwell in the past all the time, and they never live full lives in the present. They're always trying to explain the, the past or explain everything in the present with reference to the past, and so we just don't accept the past idea. We just say you got a problem here and now, and here's a way you can solve any problem in the here and now, irrespective of who you are or what happened. That's a simple, straightforward, direct way. And that's going to take away your history and your memory and all that sort of thing. This, this memory of who you are, you know, if you carry it with you, it, it's completely, you, you become like a robot. Huh? You, you just become huh, robotic. You, you're, you're programmed to behave a certain way right now because of all the things that happened before. Your boss, huh? This, if you look in the films, in the, in the modern uh, entertainment literature, all the zombies and the robots, have you noticed? It's huge. All these mechanical, robotic, zombie beings, huh? What is that about? They're, they're to they have no feelings. They have not, huh? And why do we love them, and why are they everywhere? Why are the, these huge, just great blockbuster movies full of these kind of people, these kind of things? Because they're symbols of what? Of people who are locked in the past, whose vasanas are so, so f stuck, so firm, so deep, that what they can't behave any other way. They're like zombies. And everybody knows it. And you know that part of you that just keeps repeating the same thing over and over and over and over again. And, and what that does is, re, re, what does it do? It robs you of your creativity in the present. Because acting on the basis of a past impulse doesn't necessarily solve a problem in the present. Sometimes a creative or different response is required in, every pre, in the present. And since the circumstances are changing all the time, 
Huh? I need to be present and alert and aware and what? And find a new, uh, an appropriate way to respond. That's what one of the meanings of Dharma is, appropriate response. Well, responding to a present situation in terms of a past con- conditioning is not always appropriate. It may work, but usually it doesn't. Because why? Circumstances are changing all the time. So, it's an interesting topic. The text, do we have, ah, we're almost done. (laughs) (laughs) That's my job. That's your job, you fell down, you got fascinated. Huh? It's too late now. We'll start fresh in the morning. Okay. okay. Oh, you like past lives? Do past lives. I don't care. What do I care? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Vedanta teacher. So, and I know Vedanta works for me, and I know it works for a lot of people. And, and we don't go into reincarnation and past lives and all of these kind of new agey therapies that people have. But if they work, they fine. Fair enough. We don't care. I mean, if it, if it works for you and, and you and you find that it's really valuable and beneficial, do it, please. The same as with uh, astrology, you know? The same thing. For the... the problem with astrology is what? It makes you think you're a jiva. Astrology is only focused on your damn jiva. <laughs> and there's no sadhana in astrology. Astrology may explain why you behave a certain way, but there's no way to transform those stars. So all you do is get fascinated with your jiva. That's the problem. Enneagram. I'm a seven with a six wing. <laughs> Okay, great. I'm a seven with a six wing. So I can't be a six with a nine wing? If the situation calls for a four with a three wing, I can't respond because I'm a seven with a six wing? Come on. (laughs) Huh? You just start thinking you're this person and this body and these habits. That's the problem with them because that's all they're about. They're not about the self or how to get free of the jiva. They're all just descriptions. You know, and they're very, very uh, general descriptions. Although one, there a fellow who wrote the book um, Enneagram for Dummies. He's he's a uh, I met him years ago in Boston. He wrote the book, and and uh, and I I I just sort of vaguely heard of this. It was quite fa- quite popular at one time. Gangaji's husband, uh, Eli Jackson Bear, was a kind of a a proponent of this. Enneagram thing. And I just thought, well, it's just enough, you know, somebody told me this and that. So he did it. And he, and I was really amazed at how accurate it was about my jiva. It was really, really, really close. He was very good. But so what? I already knew all of that. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't one thing that he told me that I didn't know. He was wrong on a couple of things. But, huh? So, you already know everything about yourself. You already know what your problems are, you know. Why not just get on with solving the issues that are bothering you in the present? What is about this Vedic astrology? Same story. Because they, they have the spirit... Um... That Jyotishama? Yeah. yeah, Jyotishama is about getting married, getting rich, and getting to heaven. That's what it's about. Huh? Not our concern. No, that's not what we're into. But they, they also that's why they have Jyotishama. Because it, it's a way that you can what? You can do actions at the right time. The right actions at the right time. It's, 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 it's ritualism. Uh, the right actions at the right time will produce certain results in the samsara. That's why Jyotishama and astrology is part of the, of the karmakanda, the Vedas. It's very, it's quite accurate. It's quite useful. For getting what you want from the world, but they also can tell you uh, uh, if you get free this life or <laughs> if there's a chance. So what? <laughs> there's always a chance for you to get free in this life, 
<laughs> freedom is your nature. <laughs> and you're only going to get free in this life because there's only this life. Huh? So, huh? You see what they're playing on? You're a jiva. You don't know who you are. You can get free. Blah, 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 blah. I will help you. I will help you. Spend a bunch of money here. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> huh? <laughs> no sadhana is there. We're talking as we're talking you need you need a method for what? For cleaning up your stuff. There's two methods. One's karma yoga, the other's jnana yoga, and the third is what? Upasana yoga. Upasana means meditation on objects, on forms. Karma yoga is action, an attitude with that respect to action and results. And jnana yoga is what? Discrimination. Those are the three most powerful tools and direct tools that you can you can use. So why not just use them? They work. They work for thousands of years. There's a huge long history in this tradition of free beings. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people have been set free by Vedanta. It works. It's simple. It's direct. It's practical. It's scientific. And you can do it yourself. <laughs> that's, the I, I, that's the problem you want somebody else to do it that's why you're going to astrology <laughs> yeah. yeah some operation yeah some operation absolutely no you, you know yeah it's hard work so <laughs> The last thing I want to do is fix your problems. I fix my problem. I'm enjoying my life. I fix my problem so I could enjoy my life. That's why I did it. I don't care about your problem, frankly. You you got to you got to care enough about your problem to do something about it. I'm telling you what worked for me and what's worked for lots of other people and it's working now for other people. If you read the website and the testimonials, you see the way the shining world is growing. It's not, it's the only reason this is, shining world is growing is because it sets people free and gets them on the right track. Even the karma yoga, even people who haven't got free will tell you, I don't care if I get moksha because I understand karma yoga now and my whole life has just totally transformed. It's unbelievable. The, the testimonials. We don't even publish to all of them anymore because there's so many people just writing in. People I never met before. I never saw them, never talked to them, nothing. They read the book, they watched the videos, they got on the website, read the material, and they got to work. They understood what they had to do and they started discriminating, doing the karma yoga. Suddenly, whoo, life just turns around and works beautifully. Just, you know. It's nothing to do with me, really. I'm a good communicator. I can communicate it for, with you, but this works. And this is this is Ishwar's gift to you. <laughs> that's, you know, this is, it, well, that's why we say it came from Ishwara. It didn't come from me. It didn't come from any people. It came from Ishwara. You can count on it because it came from Ishwara. All these therapies and stuff just came from people who, who cooked up all these little ideas and maybe they have limited utility and maybe they're good for a while and maybe they'll solve certain specific problems but they're not going to solve the fundamental problem the fundamental problem is only solved by what? by self-inquiry that's what Vedanta says and Vedanta survived for thousands of years because it, just because it works this tradition hasn't changed for, for 8,000 years. The basic idea of this tradition is eight, ten thousand 10,000 years old, as far as we know. It's probably longer, but we don't know. And why doesn't it change? Because it works. Why, why, why don't they invent an, a, a, a different wheel? Okay? Somebody invented the wheel. Mm -hmm. Huh? <laughs> right? Now, why don't they, somebody say, well, I'd like a wheel that's like this. Huh? I just invented a new wheel. It's shaped like this. 
okay, you invented a wheel that's shaped like this, but how long do you think that wheel's going to last? How many people are going to use that wheel? Huh? Only a few crackpots who, who you know, contrarians, who, who don't like, you know, this simple wheel that goes around in a circle. You know, rebels and, and, and goofy spiritual types. Oh, no, let's try this kind of wheel. Maybe it'll be different. <laughs> you, you see that happening here in the spiritual world. Andrew Cohen, Ken Wilber, and all. oh... No, you see, those musty old Vedanta people a long time ago, that was a different time. That was thousands of years ago. We're different now. We're more evolved. We're more advanced. We're more intelligent and spiritual. We need a new spirituality for the modern age. Please. Huh? People were greedy, selfish, stupid, and so <laughs> forth. For 10,000 years, and they're greedy and stupid and selfish now, and they're going to be greedy and stupid and selfish in the future, and this works on those people. Huh? That's it. So, huh? the problem is solved already. Absolutely. There's no need for what? There's no need for a new therapy. There's no need for a new path. Right? We're just a human being. A human being is a human being. He's got what? He's got consciousness. He's got a subconscious mind. He's got a conscious mind. He's got feelings, emotions, and thoughts. He's got sense organs, and he exists in the world. When has it ever been different? It's never been different. It's never going to be different. So give up on these new, this new stuff. Give up. Let it go. There's something that works. Be smart. Take what works. <laughs> it's simple, it's easy, it's straightforward, and it works. Get on to it, man. Forget it. All this new, fancy stuff, you know. So, anyway. <laughs> okay, good. See you tomorrow. We only have you. Only, hey, do, uh, sh shall we do? You want to start at nine thirty, or should we start at ten? No. Huh? No, you're okay. Yeah, Nobody, you're not bored. No. You're not fed up. No. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> Just think. We are doing it just a week. We are doing it forty-five years. You want us to be fed up? No, no, no. I just want, <laughs> just want to make sure you're all happy. That's all. And, and today you teach us it is boring. It is anyway. <laughs> anyway. It is boring anyway. Thank you for listening to the talk of James Swartz on the Bhagavad Gita. Recorded at Yoga Vidya Bad Meinberg near Hanover in Germany. More information on shiningworld.com and yoga-vidya.org.